The best society in the history of mankind was the society of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he cut the hand of the thief, we will cut the hand of the thief. If he stoned the adulterer, we will stone the adulterer. Because you will never find a better person in this, uh, in this life than him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we take our own uh, actions, our own penal code, our own social system, our economic system from the Quran and the Sunnah, from the actions and the sayings and the consent of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's impossible for a Muslim who believes in Allah and who believes in the Sharia to say, no, we don't cut the hand of the thief or we don't stone the adulterer. If the conditions are met, then the, the punishment will follow. If you look at the word Islam in uh, the classical Arabic dictionaries like uh, um, Imam Fairuz Abadi's Qamus al muhid he said that Islam means istislam, means submission. The Muslim is the one who submits in every aspect of life. Therefore, you know, in my relationship with my wife, with my mother, you know, in the masjid, uh, in, uh, in uh, society, and also in jihad. In jihad, we fight to defend ourselves. Sometimes we fight against the enemy. Sometimes people are killed. So Islam is peace. Then where is the concept of jihad? Where is the concept of, of a hudud, the penal code? Where we cut the hand of the thief or we stone the adulterer. So Islam does not mean peace. Islam is submission. Submission to the commands of Allah in our life. Obviously we can live peacefully with people who want to live peacefully with us. But people who want to declare war against us, we will fight them and we will defend ourselves. So this idea of Islam meaning peace is okay for those people who want to beat the Muslims and to bomb them and kill them. And they say, don't fight back because Islam is peace. No, Islam is submission. You know, if you look at Europe alone, there's over 50 million Muslims. Are we going to now desert them and say, well, it was never a Muslim country? This is rubbish. Nobody will ever say that. The whole world will become part of the Islamic State one day and will be governed by the Sharia, whether the people like it or not. If you want to work in Muslim countries, go to Muslim countries. But don't live here and say, I want to work in Muslim countries. Then you go to Muslim countries and say, well, I want to work in non-Muslim countries. And you end up not doing anything at all. We hope that the people in Britain embrace Islam as a way of life. They accept it as a better way of life than they have at the present time, which it certainly is. But it may be that uh, by way of a foreign policy of an Islamic State, the obstacles in the way of implementing the Sharia could be uh, manifesting themselves in this country. Or we could even have a kind of struggle as we saw in Bosnia or in other parts of the world where the Muslims engage with the non-Muslims and they end up in a position of authority. Now how it comes about, Allah only knows. I know that uh, the fact that it will come to Britain and to Russia and China and all other parts of the world is a certainty because the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, Allah showed me the east of the east and the west of the west and the authority of my ummah, meaning the Muslims, was over the whole of it. So it will come everywhere, including in Britain, one day. This is a, a, a prophecy and a certainty that we believe in as Muslims. You know, we abide by Islamic law. Now, if, so, if it so happens Islamic law agrees, with the law, that we do it because Islam says. So I put my seatbelt on because Allah allowed me to put it on, not because Queen Elizabeth said put your seatbelt on. And uh, anything which disagrees with Islamic law, we don't abide by. We asked Stanjum what he thought would happen to the current governing bodies if Sharia law was indeed implemented here in the UK. One of the fundamental uh, pillars of the ruling system we say is al lillah. Sovereignty belongs solely to Allah. And we can say, if you like, as bin bin Shari'i. Uh, the, the supremacy is for the Sharia in terms of life. Now, this being the case, the sovereignty in this country belongs to the Queen, to Parliament, to MPs. They make the law, they make the halal and the haram according to their own whims and desires in Parliament. This will never be the case under the Sharia. In Sharia, the law has already been determined by Allah wa ta in the Quran and through his messenger Muhammad So there's no place for sovereignty belonging to other than Allah. The Muslim uh, body, which is called the Khilafah and the administration, merely is an administrative body implementing the Sharia in life's affairs. Therefore, there'll be nothing called the Queen, there'll be no Prime Minister, no President, there'll be no uh, ministers in terms of portfolios where they implement the law and order and they decide what is good and bad. Rather, there will be uh, governors of areas there will be wulat, if you like, and there will also be managers of certain areas managing the different departments of the state. But their own uh, role will be administrative, not legislative. This is the fundamental difference between sovereignty belonging to Allah as in Islam and sovereignty belonging to man as in all man-made law and all systems like democracy, republicanism, you know, uh, whatever secular type of system you may have.
رسول الله. What do you think would happen? There's no concept of become Muslim and die. You know, this is invented by the Western media to tarnish the Muslims. They said the same thing about Afghanistan and Sheikh Osama bin Laden. They said, oh, you know, he's a freedom fighter first, fighting against the Russians, then he become a terrorist. You know, even Nelson Mandela was a terrorist, and then he become, you know, the best person ever for them. You know, so even uh, Muhammad Ali, who passed away recently, may Allah give him Jannah. First of all, he was, uh, you know, a kind of an outlaw. Then after that, he became the, the most respected person, you know, in the history, in the American history. So people can't make up their minds. You know, give it more, another 10 years or 20 years, they'll be saying, oh, the Islamic State is wonderful. We want to make Hijrah there ourselves. We want to live there. Look at the beauty of the relationship between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. You know, people go through stages and they go through uh, these phases. At the current time, because the Islamic State is rejecting the man-made borders, like the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the borders between Palestine and Jordan and Lebanon, etc. They don't like this because division and control is the foreign policy of the American uh, regime and their own allies. They like to establish their military interests, their economic interests, their strategic interests, and you sub the resources. And they do that by dividing you, you know, putting, putting puppets in, in place and quelling any uprising. But the fact is now you have a new uprising. You don't have a change of regime. You have a revolution, an Islamic revolution. But people don't accept any of the regimes. They don't accept any of the laws. They only accept divine law. This is a new phenomenon for the Americans. You know, they never faced an Islamic state implementing the Sharia. Therefore, all of the venom, all of the hatred has come. They remember a history of uh, the Crusades. They remember a history, you know, centuries of struggle in Europe between Christianity and Islam. And suddenly, this giant, this empire has re-emerged. You know, half of Europe was governed by the Sharia at one time. 800 years of, of, of Sharia in Spain. These people cannot forget this. Therefore, they will make every effort to try to, dis to extinguish the light of Allah, to put out any arising where uh, people want to call for the Sharia and the divine law. And they want to make sure that their own foreign policy and their interests in these countries are protected. And this is the real reason why this, uh, this attack is there against the Islamic State. They are not killing people, innocent people. They are not uh, just slaughtering people for the sake of it. The Christians are returning to Mosul, have returned to Mosul. Many of the Yazidis embrace Islam. The Christians, Jews and Muslims live side by side. The people who are slaughtering innocent people are via the drones. The Americans and British and others killing innocent people. They've done, before, uh, they've done this before in Afghanistan. They're doing this in Iraq and Syria. And as well, you know, through things like Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, Bagram, torturing people and then saying, oh, we'll close it one day. And it's still there. Hundreds of people being tortured. Who are the ones talking about human rights and civil liberties? And yet they don't abide by what they say. At least these people abide by what they say. They say, if you commit a crime, you'll be punished. Whereas in the West, they say one thing, and yet they do something else. They say, oh, we believe in rights and liberties. Who are the rights for the people in Guantanamo Bay? Non-existence. That is the hypocrisy of Western civilization. Having spent over four hours with Andrew in an Asian sweet store, we were somewhat unconvinced by his argument. So we asked him, whether he felt it would be more appropriate for him to be living in a country that actually adheres to Islamic laws. Well, look, at the current time, my passport has been taken and I don't have a driving license. I have certain bird conditions where I cannot go to an airport or even apply to uh, take another passport or driving license. You know, I can't associate with more than two people. I have many, many restrictions on my, on my movement. You know, but otherwise, I said openly, publicly in the media, I would love to go with my wife, my children and my friends, you know to live under the Khilafah and experience life under the Sharia. But, you know, if the government don't want you to leave, we will continue to our project to implement the Sharia where we are, you know. And the irony is this, you see, that um, all these years they've been saying, if you don't like it here, go back to your own countries. Now that people actually want to go back to Iraq and Syria, they're saying, don't go, stay here. Otherwise, you know, we're going to arrest you because you're supporting terrorists. So they can't make up their mind. You know, uh, Hidayah is from Allah. Allah is the one who guides, you know. If they understand or if they don't understand, this is not in my hands. But definitely, Islam will be implemented over the people in England, whether over their noses by force or willfully. Obviously, we prefer to be willfully with their own acceptance, and may Allah, you know, uh, guide their hearts to Islam because it would be better for them. But if they don't accept it, we're not going to stop calling for Islam and the Sharia. It will be implemented anyway. According to the various media platforms, Andrum is considered to be largely responsible for the ill reputation of the town. But what does he have to say about that? In fact, uh, if you say it's a hotbed of terrorism, then I would say superior Luton. 
because terrorism today is terrorizing the enemies of Islam. Terrorism today is equated with people who call for the Sharia. Terrorism is uh, people engaged in da'wah, in commanding good and forbidding evil. A Muslim who is practicing is perceived as a terrorism. So if I have something to do with this, with uh, getting Muslims to practice, to teach them their deen, to come out openly publicly, to condemn the government, to terrorize the enemies of Islam, then I'm very proud of this. So, you know, it depends upon your definition. Obviously, terrorism is a pejorative nowadays. It has a lot of negative connotations. But I think there can be terrorism pro-life and terrorism against life. There can be terrorism, which is, uh, you know, one person's terrorism is another person's freedom fighter. So these words, I think, have a very emotional uh, meaning for some people. So we need to define them and uh, then we can talk about them in a more meaningful manner. You say there is a good terrorism and a bad terrorism? Well, I think to terrorize the enemy. Allah said in the Quran, he said, prepare as much as you can to terrorize the enemy, the enemy of Allah and your enemy. This is in the Quran, chapter 8, verse 60. So, you know, terrorism is part of Islam. In the battlefield, you terrorize the enemy. You don't go to the battlefield and give them a bunch of flowers and some matai and say, you know, I love you. Obviously, people kill each other. And there's a lot of wars taking place in the world today, but people are terrorizing each other. So this is part and parcel of the world in which we live. I don't believe that they have evidence against any of us, you know. The irony is that we have been saying the same thing for the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, we've never changed. It's the same demonstrations, the same processions, the same, you know, conferences, press conferences. What has changed is the British government and their attitude towards the Muslim community, especially after Cameron came and he tightened the screws on what you are allowed to say and, uh, you know, so-called freedom of expression. To the extent that, you know, with the um, prevent and channel programs and uh, the social services and how they're, you know, clamping down on children, and how they, they are being so-called radicalized by their own parents because they talk about Sharia, maybe you're becoming Hafiz of Quran and you're going to evening uh, Madrasa. This is considered to be, you know, a, a, a danger to your children. So your children may be taken away by social services. Add to that the uh, amendments to the Terrorism Act dealing with inviting support for prescribed organizations, the glorification of terrorism, and really you have a whole raft of legislature which is uh, intended to demonize the Muslim community and to put pressure on them and really to silence them. While the British uh, foreign policy is engaged in occupying Muslim land and killing them and murdering them and committing all kinds of crimes from uh, Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib and we know about internment, at the same time you can't say anything about it here otherwise you'll be arrested. You know this is, uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, you know silencing individuals is a very cynical attempt from the CPS and the police to silence certain individuals who they believe are the so-called conveyor belt to terrorism. They can't pin us down on committing any atrocities, they can't pin us down to organize, you know, or fund any atrocities, but they think that we give the mindset or we give the intellectual, uh, if you like, backing or the kind of motive for people to go out to commit the crimes that they do. And you know, what we say is that we just talk about Islam. If people agree with us, it's not our fault. You know, and we always put the proviso and the caveat that we actually believe in a covenant of security, meaning our life and wealth is protected. Therefore, I don't believe it's allowed to target the life and the wealth of the people with whom we live. But I can't talk for the Michael Adabalajos or the Muhammad Sidi Khans of this world. If they want to do what they do, you can't blame me for that because I talk about Islam. But this is the problem, you see, because they can't catch those individuals. Maybe the security is too good. Now they want to go for the so-called sheikhs and the ulama and the dua to say, well, let's just silence everybody. You know, and, and you know, if you look at our own history in India, when the British were in India occupying uh, uh, Hind, at that time they said the people who, you know, believe in Jihad or Khilafah, they are Ghaddar, they are, you know, betrayers. And they had very similar laws to arrest them. And you had some chamches, some paid up lackeys of the British government at that time, so-called muftis and shayukh in India who said, yes, of course, India is Darul Islam, even with the British occupying it. And we should arrest these individuals. And like this you have, you know, paid up so-called Muslims and Munafikeen, hypocrites, who will, I'm sure, you know, uh, be all too ready to give testimony on behalf of the British government to say, yes, these people should be arrested. Finally, we are Standham. If it turns out that there is sufficient evidence against you and you are found guilty of certain offences, do you think it would be a fair judgment? First of all, I'm innocent. Even if the judge and the jury say guilty, I'm still innocent. Muslims are innocent. And, uh, you know, I did nothing wrong. So if, the, if Allah decides to test me by prison or by other kind of, uh, you know, oppression from the kuffar, that is for the Muslim kafara and tuhurun, it's forgiveness. And, you know, a, a little bit of test in this life is nothing compared to the eternal Jannah that you will get. 
So I'm happy, you know, whatever happens. We say Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Praise be to Allah in all situation. I believe strongly that there's no case, in fact. And, you know, this is an opportunity for us to pass the message even to the general public who are the so-called jury. But, uh, you know, if they do say guilty, then we are not in control. Ultimately, Allah is in control of the people who are there, what they say, how they think. You know, and I, I, I submit myself to the destiny of Allah. If I'm in prison, I will radicalize the Muslims in prison. And I will invite the non-Muslims to Islam, even in prison.